This video is going to focus on viral structure. And as you're going to see shortly, viruses are so, so, so diverse in terms of their structure. So you may remember from the last video, I mentioned that all viruses have nucleic acid, so either DNA or RNA, and then a protein coat that protects it. That protein coat is called the capsid. And sometimes it's this capsid that also contains those binding proteins, the spike protein. Other times, like you see in this picture and like you saw in the last video, sometimes the spike proteins project outwards more than the capsid, okay? And so sometimes the spike protein is part of the capsid. Others that are more kind of sophisticated um, in structure, sometimes the spike sticks out of that protective protein coat. It sticks out of that capsid. So real quick, I want to talk about the nucleic acid that a virus may have. Remember, the viral nucleic acid is going to be either DNA or RNA. It will never have both. But there's a lot of diversity in this, y'all. Some viruses have double-stranded DNA. Now that's very similar to ours. We can understand how this virus works a bit easier because the genetic material is the same as ours. But some viruses have a single-stranded DNA molecule. Now that's kind of weird, y'all, right? Living organisms don't have that, right? So it, it's a bit more complex to try to understand how this virus works. Now to really spice things up, some viruses only have single-stranded RNA. Okay, now our RNA is also single-stranded, so there's a little bit of a similarity, right? But RNA is not our genetic material. So now we're getting a little spicy. Now you really want to kick up the heat. Some viruses have double-stranded RNA. Say what? Right? We don't have that. It's kind of crazy. How on earth does this virus work? And so just looking at the genetic material, the nucleic acid, we can already see how much diversity there is. Some viral nucleic acid is linear, some are circular. Again, even more complex. So one misconception people have is they hear something is a virus and they assume it's just like all the other viruses out there, right? Well, if we can have a vaccine for this virus, why can't we for that virus? If we have antivirals for this virus, why not all the other viruses? Because in just one component, the nucleic acid, there's so much diversity. So they, it took a long time to try to understand how some of these viruses worked because they have nucleic acid that's not like ours. Okay, and they're crazy tiny, right? We had to have the technology to even study them. All right, so then if we look at that protective protein coat, that capsid, if you look at this picture here, you can see in this picture, um, there's two pieces of RNA. That was the nucleic acid for this particular virus. And here, these little circles, this collectively, this kind of oval, is the capsid, okay? Now, each tiny circle that makes up that capsid is called a capsomere, okay? So the capsid is made up of capsomeres. And collectively, this capsid is going to protect that nucleic acid, okay? Now, some viruses, like I mentioned, their spike protein, that protein that binds to the host receptor, sometimes it's a part of that capsid. Okay, but other viruses like this HIV retrovirus, sometimes they have spike proteins projecting out of the capsid. And there's a lot of diversity in the structure of these spike proteins as well. Now, even more complex, there are some viruses that are even more sophisticated. Once they've taken over the host cell, and they're ready to exit because they want to, right? That host is now sick, maybe even dying. 
So the virus particles want to get out of that sick host and go infect a healthy host. So on their way out, some viruses steal part of the host plasma membrane. That process is called budding, and we'll talk more about it later. But just think of a virus kind of literally pushing its way out of the cell. And so as it pushes its way out, it gets kind of covered in part of the cell's plasma membrane. We call this the envelope because the plasma membrane is literally enveloping the virus. Now, y'all, this is a, like a sneaky, sneaky tactic because now the virus is trying to disguise itself to look like a host protein, right? Because it has the host plasma membrane. So it's trying to be kind of stealthy and slow down um, our immune response. It's trying to trick our immune response to thinking that it belongs there. Now, fortunately, as you can see in this picture, so there is the viral envelope right here. You'll notice that these spike proteins sometimes project even farther out than the envelope. And so our immune system will eventually detect the spike proteins. It won't be fooled for long by that envelope, okay? Now, there's a lot of diversity, as you can tell, just kind of on me talking about it. We're gonna look at some pictures on the next slide. But I want to mention something. We've already talked about DNA replication and transcription and translation. And I emphasized how important it is for DNA polymerase to proofread, right? When it's making new copies of DNA, because without proofreading, then mutations would occur much more frequently. And mutations at the DNA level impact the RNA, which can impact the proteins that are supposed to be made. So because our genetic material, living things, our genetic material is DNA, it's DNA polymerase's job to make sure that it's proofreading as it creates more DNA. Well, what this means is that for RNA viruses that do not have DNA, these RNA viruses have no need for DNA polymerase when they take over the cell, right? Rather, they're gonna use something else, but that means that they aren't going to be proofread. So RNA viruses mutate much more frequently than DNA viruses. This is why we have to get flu shots every year. The flu or influenza virus is an RNA virus. It mutates very rapidly. SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID, is an RNA virus. So it doesn't have any proofreading. That's why it mutates so quickly and all these new strains keep popping up, okay? Because there's nothing there to proofread and make sure that the nucleic acid stays the same. Okay, so mutations happen a lot more frequently in RNA viruses. So in order for a virus particle to be able to infect a host, it has to be completely intact. It has to have the nucleic acid that's protected by the, the capsid. And if it's a more sophisticated virus, it has to have its envelope and spike proteins whatever that virus looks like, but it has to be completely intact. When a virus is intact and capable of infecting a host, we call it a virion, okay? So technically we would say virions infect hosts and make hosts sick. All right, so let's look at some pictures here. So we can classify or describe viruses based on the structure of their capsid, of that protein coat. If you have ever seen a slinky, okay, that's what you can think of when we talk about a helical capsid, okay? So just like a slinky, if you were to stretch it out, right, it's, it's a helical, it's like spirally shaped, but if you push it together, right, it's just a hollow cylinder. That's what the helical capsid is like. And so this red here is the genetic material. Okay? The yellow circles are the protein uh, capsid, that protein coat, okay? So helical capsids resemble a slinky. They're cylindrical shape and hollow in the middle where the genetic material is. And these are actual pictures of a helical virus. This is tobacco mosaic virus. 
other viruses have an icosahedral capsid. So here, um, I tend to just draw it um, like a, a pentagon here. Sometimes I'll even draw it more like a hexagon, but um, it's this general shape that you see here, about 20 sides, normally about 12 vertices. And then some are what we call complex morphology. And these are gonna be more like bacteriophage, which are viruses that only infect bacteria. And we call them complex because they have icosahedral portions and helical portions. So if you look at this picture, you'll see this icosahedral um, capsid at the top here. Okay, that's what you can see the genetic material inside. And then here's the helical portion that makes up the sheath. So it's a hollow cylinder. And then bacteriophage also have these tail fibers. That's how they literally like dock and attach to the bacteria. And what they'll do, and we'll talk more about this in a future video, is they inject their genetic material like a syringe. So it leaves the capsid and it goes down through the sheath and into the bacteria. So again, much like a syringe. And here you can see the picture of the bacteriophage attached to a host bacterial cell. All right, so here's something that I want you to think about. Okay, there's a lot of answers for this particular um, prompt, but I want you to think about all the diversity that we just talked about when it comes to viruses. So their genetic material is different, the shape of their capsid is different, the shape of their spike proteins can be different. Um, do they have an envelope? to try to camouflage themselves, do they not? So how do you think this diversity in viral structure makes our lives as human hosts more complicated, okay? Think about research and all that must go into trying to understand these viruses. Think about what we need research for, for right? Understanding them, how they impact humans, how can we combat them, okay? So this is something I want you to think about, all right? That's the end of this video. Please let me know if you have any questions.